Exactly. <laughs> All right, testing. So, in other words, we just need this to the, go the back, not to not the here. And I okay. think it's I think it's back here. Okay, testing. All right, do you guys have audio coming in there? Do you do? Sounds good? Okay, so it's not going over? All right. Okay, I think we figured it out. It's, uh, it's yeah, set up for pressure, right? The level the and let me hand the phone to Michelle so she can turn it up. Here, but it's all the way cranked. Okay. Okay. Sure. All right. <laughs> and with this, are we, uh, are we ready? Is everybody set up so we can have the sheriff come down? Yeah. Sounds good. We will get her get her done.
Hey folks, how are y'all doing today? Hey, I'm sure. How are you? Good, good. It's good to see you all today as we talk about a undercover operation or a covert operation or a follow-up operation that our detectives have done for a period of time with the Department of Corrections, Probation, and Parole. I'm joined today by Stephanie Perry. Stephanie is the, is the circuit administrator, and certainly she's going to have some comments after I do. One thing that's required by sex predators and sex offenders is, is that they go through a registry process. And depending on who they are and what their charges are, that determines on what and how they register and how often they register. So we're not going to get down in the bushes on that. But part of the operation was dealing with sex offenders and sex predators that were on a registry process or a probation and registry because they were violating the law or had violated the law in the past with the allegations being against children. The other part of the operation is our child pornography investigations where we were looking on peer-to-peer -to, -peer to see if people were out actively trying to either possess and or transmit or deal in child pornography. And here's what we found. We made 42 total arrests. Of the 42 arrests we made, 37 were child-related. And there's one outstanding warrant, and I'll go over that person in just a minute. The operation took about three and a half weeks, and obviously we were able to be as successful as we were because we were joined by Department of Corrections probation officers who did an outstanding job with our detectives who just do a fantastic job every day. But these are the folks who prey on children, and we prey on them to keep them from children as best we can. We have two of our sex predators who are on probation and they received a viol violation of probation. They had previously been to prison and were on a probation after prison. And the other two were simply failure to appropriately register. Sexual predators are required to register a minimum of four times a year. The other are sex offenders and it had to deal with child victims. And the sex offenders have to re register twice a year. And there are proactive reg registry checks that are required of them, such as they have to register their vehicle, they have to register where they live. If they are permitted to be on a computer, and some of them are, then they have to register their computer IP addresses and the systems that they're on, or the social media systems. Failure to appropriately register is a new third degree felony that can get them a minimum of five years in prison, and we like that a lot. Now our child porn arrest. There were 18 of these folks, and the one outstanding, we weren't able to identify any child victims during this operation. That is our main focus, is to try to identify child victims. All of the child porn we dealt with in this particular operation appear to be commercial child pornography, and the children were between infant or newborns and 14 years of age. Most of them, however, were between 5 and 8 years old. Six of the 19 offenders had more than 100 images or videos. And for just a few minutes, we will do our profile of what we call our poster ch children. Our number one poster child is Eric Gordon. Eric Gordon has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Now, you can't make this stuff up. In social work, and you know what his specialty is? You guessed it, counseling children, where he worked for Peace River Center. 
He was charged with 38 counts of promotion or trading of child pornography. He's married, and he has a two-year-old child himself with no previous criminal history. Here is a man that's in the business to counsel children in severe distress, and he's a child pornographer. Michael Wolf. Michael Wolf is self-employed. He is a martial arts instructor, and guess what? Among his clients are what? Children. The youngest children, child that he currently has in his martial arts class is five years old. He works out of the Southside Barbell Gym in Lakeland. He was charged with one count of promotion of child porn. It's interesting to know that he appeared to upload child porn in a teen chat room. And he also, up to this time, had no criminal history. It was our honor to give him some criminal history because, after all, he's dealing with child porn while he's working with children. And, of course, this is unique. And we find it interesting. This is Michelle Roberts and Richard Bishop. They claim to be married, at least common law married. There are three children in their home less than five years of age. They're both charged with 20 counts of child pornography. They are sharing child pornography this, as far back as we can remember, is the very first couple that both got arrested. Apparently, they utilized child porn in maybe some of their own sexual environments. We don't see any evidence that their children are victims of child porn. And we can't remember another woman that's been arrested in a peer-to-peer -peer child porn operation. Maybe you can. So they get the dubious distinction of being the first husband and wife arrested for peer-to-peer -peer child porn. And she gets the first position of being a woman arrested in a peer-to-peer -peer operation that we recall. These are nasty, nasty people. All of them. And this is a family affair of nasty, nasty people. And how about Mark Ewald? He has a Bachelor of Science from USF in Computer Science. He, he works for Presidium, and Presidium is a contract company, so if you need a network set up or need network work done, you hire Presidium, and they'll send Mark out to you. Well, except that he's detained right now in jail. He has his own server at his home so he can access any data that he has from any place in the world. He's a member of our 100 plus club. He has over 100 counts of child pornography. This is a deviant of the first order. And of course, Michael Dietz goes to Polk State College where he's studying computer science. He said he's been viewing child porn for 14 years, and he's been viewing this child porn with children as young as three months old. He, too, is a member of our 100-plus club child porn. Here's the guy that's hiding from us. Now, Matthew Sutton's got a good mama, because she would not only not cooperate with us, she actually went to jail in the process by frustrating us while we were trying to actively do a search warrant. But she's not telling us where Matthew Sutton is or where he works. She just interfered while we were trying to do the search warrant at his house. But we want Matthew in jail because we've got him charged with 84 counts of child porn. 
Now listen to me. Here's the deal. Call Crime Stoppers, 1-800-226-TIPS. We don't have to know who you are. You get Mr. Matthew Sutton locked up with your information, for which he'll never know where it comes from, and we'll give you green cash. Think about that. A child pornographer goes to jail, and you get green cash. And after all, he belongs in jail, and he's hiding from us currently. You got a good mama. She's trying to give you cover. Doesn't do any good. You go into jail anyway. Mama should have talked to you about not possessing child porn, however. Then there's Charles DeMay. Charles DeMay is the only one of the predators or offenders we highlighted because he is our he is our antique of the group. He's 82 years old, and he's a sexual offender. And he's a retired high school te teacher out of Williamsburg, South Carolina. He was charged when he was 79 years old. And he just does not want to follow the rules. But here's an 82-year-old man. And this dude won't even go by the rules now. Well, Charles, I hate for you to spend the rest of your life in prison. But you earned it. And you're going to prison. Okay. Before we take questions, please allow me to turn the podium over to Stephanie Perry, who has some comments and some information she wants to share with you. Thank you, Sheriff. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I would just like to share that an integral piece of the Department of Corrections mission is to ensure public safety. And the correctional probation officers here in Circuit 10 are committed to serving and protecting the citizens of Polk, Hardy, and Highlands County. Our probation officers are charged with ensuring that our offenders are in compliance with the conditions of their supervision and also to hold those offenders who are found in noncompliance accountable. As a result of our probation officers partnering with the Sheriff's Office on Operation Child Guardian, 12 of the offenders under the supervision of the Florida Department of Corrections have been incarcerated and now the public is more safe. We would also like to thank Sheriff Judd and his team for their continued support and partnership. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions? I knew you'd have some questions. <laughs> you always do. We know do. each other too well, yes. don't we? Yes. Uh, was there some type of incident or tip or something that, I mean, I know you've done lots of these investigations in the past, but this particular investigation, was there something that led to it? Yes. Okay. My absolute total disdain for people okay. who abuse children. And that is the top priority among many high priorities at the Sheriff's Office. And our detectives just do an awesome job. <coughs> Makes me sneeze every time I think about it. I'm allergic to them. <laughs> it seems like a lot of these guys <coughs> claim to be addicted to it. Can you talk to that? They are, you know, I hate to use the word addiction because that would give an indication of, of maybe some kind of a, a, a sickness which may be may give them some kind of a defense. What these folks are is is deviance. In their screwed up minds, this is normal conduct. It's acceptable conduct. Now most of them will tell you academically that they know it's wrong, it's against society's norms. But it's good for them. Well, we also think prison is good for them. And that's what we're going to do is do our very best to send every one of them to prison or back to prison. Many of them are out, and they have the rules. All they have to do is follow the rules. I have an entire team of four people and an analyst that make sure these folks do what they're supposed to do. In addition to the work that DOC does through the pro when they're on probation. 
So there's no excuse for that conduct except they're not rule followers and they're deviants and I don't like them and they need to be in prison. Can you talk to us a little bit more in detail about what Eric Gordon does at Peace River Center for Child Children in Crisis? I don't know other than he works for Peace River Center. His specialty is child counseling and we we told Peace River that y'all would probably end up wanting to talk to them before the day was over. And, and by the way, I, I need to give this editorial comment about Peace River Center. They are awesome. I help them raise funds. I'm, I'm very involved with Peace River Center. They do miraculous work in the community. But hey, even great organizations can have a bad apple. And they got one that's rotten all the way to the core. It ju you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to get down in the weeds, okay, because every one of them can have a different restriction. Depend. But here's what it says. The, the offenders have to at least register twice a year. The predators have to register four times a year. But then depending on what your status is, you have to register your cars, you have to register where you live. Some are not permitted to have any access to social media or the Internet at all. Some are able to have access to the Internet or, and or social media if they register those accounts. So it just depends on which person you're talking about and what their specific requirements are. But failure to do that is a third-degree felony, a new felony charge that can get them five years in prison on that charge alone. So, and if they're on probation, then of course they can go back and revoke their probation and get that time as well. What do you think about the fact that they were watching Teen Titans? I mean, not that any child's okay, but I mean, is that just, I think, goes to show the child is suffering? It's interesting that when you investigate these cases, depending on the individual, some like little girls, some like little boys, some like blonde hair, some like brown hair, some like infants, some like three-year-olds, some like five-year-olds, some like ten-year-olds, some like twelve-year-olds. And, and folks, this, this is, when you're looking at this child pornography, we're not talking about somebody that took a picture of their infant, you know, at birth, you know, or you know, we're talking about Sexual deviant conduct here. Yeah, Sheriff, that's what I was going to ask you. I, obviously, you have to be delicate here, but I mean, are we talking, in, in most of these cases, are we talking about just nude, maybe sexually provocative pictures of children, or are we talking about the children? Actually engaged in sex acts. Both. Both. They may so have. Most of them are. They may have positioned the children intentionally into sexually provocative positions. Many times, it's sex acts, and it can be sex acts with other children, with adults, or with animals. So he has all these other kids that he has close contact with. He's never overstepped his bounds with any of those kids? We have absolutely no indication of that at this point in the investigation. There's still questions to be asked and work to be done. A lot of that will be done by Peace River Center because, as you well know, a lot of that is confidential, so that's not information that anyone would have access to. But Peace River would know who the clients are and certainly we anticipate we'll be working with Peace River. And if we get any iota of information that he did anything inappropriate with the children, then we'll be all over him before quick. Would you be surprised if he did? Interestingly enough, some of these people can compartmentalize their, their conduct. So... I wouldn't tell you that it is absolutely, totally impossible for me to, for him to conduct professional 
child counseling at work and then go home and be a deviant at night. But I was born in the morning, but it wasn't yesterday. You have a guy who has an interest in deviant child conduct, and he's also counseling children. It gives him easy access. So a red flag automatically goes up, which means we automatically pay very, very close attention to his conduct and what he's doing at work. Was his wife totally unaware of this? I haven't talked to his wife. I don't, I don't have any idea. He did not confess. I, I don't believe he confessed at all. Um, Let me show you his picture again. Everybody needs a second look at this dude. Oh, Eric Gordon. Bachelor's and a master's in social work with a specialty and a focus in working and counseling youth. 38 charges. This, has, this is not an accident. These people we arrest, they tell us, oh, I accidentally hit a button. Oh, yeah, 38 times? How'd that work for you? No criminal history, married with a two-year-old baby. I'm sure. Excuse me? How did you come across him as a suspect? Great investigative technique. <laughs> Some of this comes from Nick Mick, National, uh, National Crime, let me see, Center. Center, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Nick Mick does a lot of wonderful work. Yes, sir. Um, perhaps you or Ms. Perry, uh, since some of these had arrest records and prison terms, when, when someone is released from prison, I understand they have to register twice or four times a year, I get that, but when, when they're released from prison, are they automatically registered on these sex offender, on the sex offender sites? We instruct them to immediately report to the sheriff's office and register. It's not a it's not a immediate thing that happens. They actually have to physically go to the sheriff's office and register. So did some of them just not do that at all? As Sheriff Judd was saying, they registered in part and withheld some information that was required, like okay. social media sites, internet, yeah, yeah, right. okay. email addresses, things of that nature. On, on the social media aspect of this, uh, if social media can be used in a way that predators can uh, easily access children when they might not be other, able to through other means, do you think they should be able to have social media accounts at all? Well, it, you know, obviously I would rather they not have any access to the Internet at all. I don't know why they give them access, some of them access to the Internet. That would be a question for the rule makers as opposed to the enforcers, but I can assure you of this, that these are people who have a proclivity to have a, a, an interest in children, a sexual interest in children, and they should be kept away from children at all cost. And how can parents make sure their kids aren't, you know, chatting with somebody online? Well, it go, we, we discuss this often, that if you're going to allow your children to have access to social media, you need to know when and where, wh when they're on it, where they are when they're on the social media, and who they're talking with. And you need to pay attention to where they are meandering around. Because children can get into trouble, or children can go out there and put out their profile, and these kind of deviants come to them. And then the children, depending on the age of the child, may be uh, interested or curious all the way to they're just being stalked by these folks. I, I mean, you, you know, we've, we've gone over this for many, many, many operations. They will stalk the kids. Some of them deal with child pornography. We know the overwhelming majority that deal with child pornography will elicit and be involved with illegal sex with a child if the opportunity presents itself. Some of them only, only view the child pornography and don't have actual sexual contact. But at the end of the day, it's all wrong. And we need people to understand when we talk about 
child pornography. We're not talking about the 16 or 15 year old girl that looks like she's 25. We're talking about babies that are sexually abused. We're talking about babies that are used as sexual tools or prop in a trade. We're not talking about mama taking a picture of the sweet little infant, you know, on the blanket. You know, it, we're talking about deviant criminal conduct. Of the 43 people involved here, how many are have no record at all and how many have prior records? I'll have Scott and Kerry get that to you. Some of them have no criminal. Some of the new child pornography folks right. had no previous criminal history. Yeah. Obviously, the sex offenders and predators all did, and some of them, some of them, this was the first time they were caught. But let me tell you something. You don't wake up at 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 and do this for the first time. This is a manifestation of severe deviant conduct. This is commercial child porn. This is profession what we saw was professionally produced. Sometime with uh, the advent of technology today, you can do this in your home, and we see a lot of that that we didn't used to see, that where people are actually creating this child porn at home. That's not what we found this time. But our primary goal is to try to identify the victims because these children are victimized when it originally occurs and they're victimized every time it's replayed. So we want to locate the children. This time we weren't able to locate any children, only the fact of the, the commercial child porn. Sheriff, the, the murder in Mulberry, did the 15-year-old step in to protect his mom? We're looking into this investigation, and we're <clears throat> at this time. Here's what we know about the murder in Mulberry. Last night at about 12.50 a.m., we responded to 305 Gibbon Street in Mulberry to investigate a shooting where 37-year-old Paul Gregg Jr. was deceased from a gunshot wound. Deputies are currently meeting with Paul Gregg's girlfriend, 36-year-old Jessica Whitten, <clears throat> and her 15-year-old son, Michael Cole Whitten. At this point in the investigation, it's a, just a red-hot mess, and we're sorting it out. Apparently, Jessica's got another boyfriend, and we've got Paul Gregg, who was angry and mad, and we got the 15-year-old son, Michael Cole, that was caught in the middle. And there, uh, apparently, Paul Gregg was drunk last night, and they left to get away from him. And when they came back, he was asleep, and then he woke up, and then he decided he wanted to eat, and then he started threatening the mom. And then along the way, at some point in time in the melee, uh, Michael Cole, when shot and killed Paul Gregg Jr. Now, what we're sorting out is, is this self-defense or is this murder? And we'll let you know that just as soon as our investigation is complete. We should have it sorted out by this afternoon sometime. Uh, but it's a... Go ahead. The gun that the boy used, was that the, it says here that uh, Greg had pointed a shotgun. Yes. Uh, is that the gun the boy used? Yes. Or did he have another gun? Shot him with a shotgun. With the, he somehow got the gun from the victim. I don't see it. It says he's armed with a knife. Greg is armed with a knife. The, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to throw That's that. one of the allegations. Let, let, let me say this again, so if y'all missed it the first time and don't have time to review your tape, it's a red hot mess. We're trying to figure it out, okay? It, you know, I, I can tell you 
I can tell you clearly, this was not leave it to beaver, okay? It was not that environment at all. So we are trying, we, you know, we, we've got a man that was drunk. We've got his girlfriend who he's lived with for apparently about five years who's known to partake in the, in the evil liquid as well. We've got a boyfriend of the girlfriend. We've got a 15-year-old kid in the middle of this manure pile, and we're trying to sort it all out. And when we do, we'll let you know. But it's ugly. Anytime somebody dies, it's not good. Did they contact you? Did they contact the sheriff? Oh, they dialed 911. They, dialed they ran from the house, apparently, and dialed 911. Okay. And the 15-year-old, is he in custody? He's being arrested for this thing? Or he's still self-defense? We don't know. That's, we, we have them here talking with them at this point in time. The, but we will let you know just as soon as we sort it out exactly what we're going to do with this investigation. It's preliminary. I mean, it just started at 1230, and we, we're less than 12 hours into it, and we want to make sure we do this exactly correct. So, the, and, and here's, here's the, you know, the $64 question. Is it self-defense or is it murder? We know we have a death investigation, a homicide investigation, and as soon as we make that determination, we'll let you know. If it's self-defense, he'll go home. If it's murder, he'll go to jail. Yes, ma'am. I have unrelated questions really quick. I know this is in your jurisdiction. The gun store is getting hit in Bartow. Once again, a gun owner not locking up their guns. What do you have to say? I don't know how many ways... I can say this, or how many different ways I can say this, but the bottom line is if you have guns, you have an ethical and moral obligation to lock them up. If you run a gun store, you have a greater ethical and moral obligation to lock them up. You have to create a system whereby the guns are secure and the infrastructure, the alarms, the video are such that it delays the burglars long enough trying to get in that law enforcement can get there to them. But sometimes they're more interested in making money than they are having a secure facility and you end up with a burglary. I don't know a thing in the world about the Bartow, the Bartow burglary in the city of Bartow. I do know this, that burglars and thieves are not necessarily stupid people. They're looking for high return and low risk. And as long as the gun stores pre show a low risk and a high return, they're going to continue to be broken into. And where are those guns going? They're all going to the street where they're going to be sold on the street, and the overwhelming majority of them are going to be used in other crimes and other murders and potentially against law enforcement officers. And it makes me hopping up and down mad when a gun store won't appropriately secure the guns. Now, I don't know if that's the case in Bartow. Maybe there was some elaborate systems that they had and the burglars just were able to compromise those, but I doubt it. And I can tell you the fact that we stand up and say, secure your, your firearms, maybe not sufficient. I also have my crime prevention people going around and making contact with all the gun stores and going, would you help a brother out here? Would you lock your stuff up? But you shouldn't have to beg. There should be a no. law that says we're going to kick you in the butt if you don't do the right thing. Why is there not a law like that on the books? Well, you know, it's sad that you got to make a law for everything. I mean, to, to me, the common sense here is they lose a whole lot of money. And probably they're not insured, or if they're insured, once they give these guns away to the burglars for not insuring them right, they probably don't have insurance the second time. Some things you would think just our capital, capitalistic society would take care of itself. But that's the next step. If people don't behave and don't take care of the guns, you can imagine that there will be legislation at some point in time entered or requested through the state of Florida that says, hey, you're criminally liable if you don't at least secure your guns. But it's not there yet. You know, normally the legislature does not 
react to a single event or a small trend, but it frustrates me very badly because these guns all go to the street to the crooks. Nobody buys a gun off a street corner at a substantially reduced risk, a brand new gun. They just don't do it unless they're a crook or a convicted felon and can't get a gun any other way. How many more of these burglaries have to happen? I mean, before something happens. Well, you know, many years ago, we, there, there was some burglaries in an area, and all of a sudden the burglaries dried up. And I go, you know why the burglaries dried up? And they go, why? I said, well, because there's nothing left to steal there. So it, it's, it's like, I, I don't know. You know, if I own a gun store and I see the burglar stealing guns hand over fist, I say to myself, self, we need to have a re-evaluation of our security system here. Obviously, some gun stores still haven't got the message. Well, what occurs is a lot of these burglars want to get out of their home area, so they go to another county. And when they come to an area and they have a successful burglary of a gun store, it makes news. So the other burglars, home watching your evening news program, go, hey, I think I'll try that deal out. So, you know, some of it is mar television marketing. And, but you would think your gun store would do sort of figure that out as well. It frustrates me very badly. And I've got to tell you, the people that I know that own gun stores are good people, and they would not intentionally allow someone who shouldn't have a gun have a gun. But if you're not locking your store up appropriately, whether you mean to or not, you're allowing those folks to have guns. So listen to me. Again, lock your guns up. If you don't, the thugs are going to have them. Anything else we want to talk about? <laughs> How about Wall Street? We can talk about that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> See y'all later. Oh,